welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> OB starting to make fun of my opening there. Welcome to another episode of Apostolic Outlook. Praise God, this is Reverend Ted Tarr. Amen. And we're just launching out on our second six months here. Episode 27 of an Apostolic Outlook. Isn't that something? Episode 27. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm just an old one God, tongues talking, apostolic, Holy Ghost filled preacher. Just somebody who's trying to live for God. I've been... Uh, bapt got baptized in Jesus' name in um, 1968 and uh, been trying to live for God, hallelujah, and do what he says and, and, and be what he wants me to be. Like I say, the name of our show is An Apostolic Outlook. Now, you notice we did not title it The Apostolic Outlook because it's not the, uh, like I say, we're preachers and when uh, we uh, we see the word of God and we try to obey the word of God and basically what I'm doing here on this show here is, is trying to point out to you because I, I believe with all my heart what Psalms 34 and 3 says oh magnify the Lord with me let us exalt his name together you know the word magnify just means to make clearer and to make uh, so you can see better like when a, a telescope is looking at the moon you're magnifying that moon uh, you're looking through that telescope. I know that moon looks like you can almost reach out and touch it. That moon is not one inch closer than it was when you're not looking at the telescope. What you're seeing is seeing it better. It's like looking through a microscope. Them little germs are not ready to come into your living room and, you know, be like them monster movies and break down your door. You just see them better. Hallelujah, so you can understand them. Now I'm just trying to help you see Jesus a little bit better and have a better understanding of who and what he is and how he loves you and how he will take care of you. All right. Hey, guys, praise God. Um, uh, we want to thank God for all his many blessings. We want to thank God for uh, winter's going downhill. Here it is, 1st of March already. Uh, hey, I want to let everybody know, too, uh, uh, we had a little... Uh, uh, problem uh, with the uh, so we're no longer on Twitch. Uh, all our uh, uh, broadcasts are going to be taped here for the month of March. Uh, we're shooting toward April 1st to go back live again, but that does not interfere one bit for you sending me the emails, uh, uh, send me comments and questions and uh, whatever you want to do. Praise God because I do appreciate the input. Uh, my email address is rev.tedtar at gmail.com. Uh, my Facebook uh, address is uh, bit.ly forward slash revtedtar. Uh, as you know, and my, uh, it's uh, Ted with one D and tar with two R's. My feed burner is uh, bit.ly forward slash an apostolic outlook. And we're, we are still on the Geeky Antics Network, and we do appreciate uh, Yogi and uh, Obi for uh, letting us be here and, and talk about God and hallelujah, because that's what it's all about. You know, um, we can get a little closer to God if we can get a little higher up. Hallelujah. And, and you know, the, like the old gospel songs, we're climbing uh, Jacob's Ladder. Praise God, trying to get closer to God. Now, Obi just uh, sh shot something over here on the screen. He told me, we're shooting to be uh, live on YouTube um, uh, in April or so, w whenever we can. We'll let you know as it gets closer. And uh, live on YouTube. Now, as you know, you're, you're catching these uh, uh, recorded uh, broadcasts here on YouTube. So uh, we're going to do our best to do that, and we'll give you updates on how we're going on that. Okay? All right. Let's open with prayer here. And... Um, ask God's blessing and his anointing here and uh, we'll kind of go from there Lord Jesus we thank you we thank you we thank you we thank you for your goodness and we thank you for your grace we thank you oh God Lord for giving us this opportunity to come and and and, and be a part of people's lives Lord Jesus God and God I'm asking if you for anointing your anointing yeah, that you help me say what needs to be said and, and, and have the spirit, oh God, to, to say it, Lord, that it needs to be. God, I don't know men's hearts and I don't know their needs, but you do. Oh God, in the power of your name, Jesus, I'm asking for your direction and help and, and, and blessing on this, God. Let me say something that would help somebody see you clearer 
Hallelujah. And that may, I know if they could see you clearer, they would love you. They would love you. They would love you more. We thank you. We thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. Now, I got a couple of, well, I got a shout out here. I want to uh, give a shout out to Obi's mom. Uh, Obi's mom is uh, celebrating her anniversary today. It's been 40 years today that she got married to her first husband. Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, you know Obi's my boy. But um, praise God, 40, 40 years. So, Tina, amen. Happy anniversary. Hallelujah. God is good. <laughs> Who'd have thought we'd ever live this long? But uh, amen. <laughs> yeah. Praise God, praise God, and isn't that something, man? Oh man, you turn your you turn your head, and you're a hundred years old. All right, all right. Now uh, we're gonna go in a direction. As you know, last week we we finished up about love, and well, you never really completely finish up about it, but we was talking about love, and uh, this week I thought I'd uh, launch out into what uh, is commonly known as the Beatitudes. Or uh, some people call it uh, the the Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus talking. Uh, now, as you know, everything we read is in the King James version of the Bible. And uh, when Obi gets that uh, those scriptures up there and stuff, he will uh, uh, you, the scriptures that we use are all in the what I quote and the one I use are it's written out of the King James version of the Bible. I I, I have the the, the scriptures and uh, uh, everything is down below. Hallelujah on the screen. And because uh, I think that's closer to what um, way God wanted it said. I know a lot of people get all hepped up and irritable about these and thous and, and uh, that stuff. That, but it's not about that. It's, it's a matter of uh, uh, just not subjecting. You know, the King James Version of the Bible was, was written right out of the direct, you know, Greek and Hebrew um, languages and a lot of the modern day versions uh, you know i'm not here condemning and and putting down but they, they just don't seem to have the same luster they don't seem to have the same depth they, they don't they just don't it doesn't read the same so praise god uh, like i say i do that just because that's who i am and uh, i don't condemn anybody for using any of the modern day versions praise god uh but uh, like i say try the king james i think you'll really like it okay um now this uh, Sermon on the Mount was a uh, they re they called it that because one of the times that Jesus talked it if you really want to uh, check it out uh, it's basically in Matthew the first book of the New Testament in the fifth and sixth and seventh chapters of Matthew uh, it's where Jesus talked uh, and Jesus taught us uh, how we should be and and how we should look at things and how we should treat people how we should treat God and how we should treat one another. Uh, now this week, basically, we're talking about the first uh, 12 verses of the fifth chapter of Matthew. Matthew 5, verses 1 through 12. And uh, we're talking about the Beatitudes. That's uh, what they call them, the Beatitudes. Uh, the word Beatitude breaks down to be um, uh, blessed or happy or, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it's a... Uh, Something that uh, when Jesus taught us, he, he, he this is how he wants us to be. All right, uh, if you basically, and if, you know that's what being a Christian is all about. Because uh, uh, in the church, in the New Testament church, uh, that's what they were called was Christians, and they were first called Christians in uh, the Book of Acts, in the eleventh chapter, in the twenty-sixth verse, in the, uh, one of the major outreach centers of the. Um, New Testament in the city of Antioch and they were called Christians because they acted like and they um, tried to copy the life of Jesus and try to be like he wanted them to be and wanted to say what he wanted them to say and, and that's really what being a Christian is all about uh, uh, you know I am not a uh, uh, following somebody I'm not following a mighty teacher I mean, you can uh, have some preacher named Smith. I'm not a Smithite. I'm not a, you know, a lot of other things. I am a Christian, which uh, uh, trying to copy and pattern my life after the works of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
So let's uh, launch out here in the book of Matthew, the fifth chapter, and uh, reads like this. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, I know this kind of sounds kind of different, but I thought we'd try to break it down here a little bit. Maybe you could understand a little bit more what we're talking about. Um, in the book of Luke, when Jesus taught this lesson again, he was not on the mountain. He was on a, uh, a plain. And in another place in the Bible, he was in another location. So you see, this is not just a one-time thing when he taught. This is something he taught that I believe he taught everywhere he went. You know, um, you can read a lot of places in the New Testament in the in the, the Gospels, which is uh, what we call Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or the, the story of Jesus when he sat and taught the people. And I believe the stuff that he taught them was always what we have right here in Matthew, the 5th, 6th, and 7th chapter. All right? And he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Now Luke says, blessed are the poor. But I think Matthew brings it out a little bit better. Matthew uh, tells us, blessed are the poor in spirit. Uh, that's not saying that you got to be a monk, you know, and you got to give every way, everything you can. And, and some people uh, pervert the, uh, the Bible and said uh, money is the root of all evil. Nah, 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 nah. The Bible don't say that. I'll tell you straight up, the Bible don't say that. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. It's not uh, having stuff. No, God don't go. God wants us to have stuff. You know, it's all right. It's just when that stuff gets more important to us than God. But it wasn't even talking about that. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. That's a key there. Check that out. Poor in spirit. Um, and that's not uh, like talking about people that walk around, you know, like uh, the, the Winnie the Pooh character, Eeyore. You know, they go, oh, boy, is me. I think it's going to rain. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I see a cloud. I better get struck by lightning. No, it's not talking about uh, a sorrowful, mopey, um, uh, defeated attitude. Poor in spirit is, is more of a, a meekness and a acknowledgement of, of your need all right it's 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 not being high-minded and heady and and uh, think you're better and it's realizing how much you need God all right uh, a, a fine example of that is in Luke the 18th chapter Luke 18 and verse 10 uh, Jesus gave us this parable, and I think this helps us understand what being poor in spirit is about a little bit. Uh, Luke 18 and 10 uh, says, Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. And the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, as extortioners or unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not so much as lift as lift so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Okay, that's a, a example of a, a, a contradiction of the two attitudes. The Pharisee, which was a part of the religious uh, uh, of Israel, or the religious uh, hierarchy of Israel, uh, said, I want you to uh, take a little note here. He said he prayed thus with himself. <laughs> I, 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 what good does that do? What good does that do one bit? I mean, if you're going to pray, you need to pray to God. But he prayed thus with himself. I mean, doesn't that explain, doesn't that help us all see what the, 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 the joke is about this? I mean, he said, God, I thank thee. So you can, I mean, you could, I could see it in my mind. And if you all think about it, you can see what this, this must have looked like. Here's this guy, man, all primed and proper and, and, and uh, uh, nose lifted up in the air about, you know, 
about 30 degree angle and looking down at everybody making sure he had people watching making sure he had people that would notice his prayer and started off god i thank you that i am not like all these other rabble <laughs> I am better than all of them. I fast. And, you know, the Bible tells us what they fasted like. When they fasted, they painted their faces so it would be gray, so it looked like they'd been on this unbelievably long fast. They were near, they were really just, you know, just all they were doing is heaping uh, 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 glory and heaping praise on themselves, putting on a show. I mean, living for God is not about putting on a show. Living for God is supposed to be out of your heart. Praise God. And I'm not saying we, we don't dress modestly and we don't uh, live for Him and we don't try to uh, be holy and, and on our outside attitudes and stuff. Yeah, but it's not supposed to come from being a show. It's supposed to come because that's what your heart is. I mean, out of the treasure of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Praise God. Where a man's treasure is, there will his heart be also. A couple of uh, fine scriptures about that. It's just, you, you've got to be inwardly. I mean, if you're uh, high-minded and think you're better than anybody, God wants you to be poor in spirit. God wants you to realize how much you need Him. The Bible said... Um, at all, uh, we're born in sin and shaped in iniquity. Uh, the Bible said that uh, if any man say he had not sinned, he's a liar. I mean, we all need God. And that's what the Holy Ghost is here for. It will help us, hallelujah, through the power of the name Jesus and having the Holy Ghost, we can put on the righteousness of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And it just we that's one thing that the Lord's Prayer taught us. He said, not my will, but thine be done. Hallelujah, not, not me, not me, not me, but thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. You know, it's, it's a matter of being poor in spirit, having a humble attitude between you and Jesus. I like verse 13. And the publican, Standing afar off would not so much as lift his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Seven word prayer. Seven little old words. And look at the next verse. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Verse 14. For everyone that exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Blessed, 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 blessed are the poor in spirit. Those that we realize how desperately we need God. I got one more fine example here for you. And here's an, uh, I'm showing you some opposites. So if you look at the opposite, you can see some of the idea of what I'm talking about. Over in the book of Revelations, in the last chapter um, I mean, in the last book of the, the Bible, in Revelations, the third chapter, and starting in the 14th verse, Revelations 3 and 14, And unto the church, unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot, I would thou were cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Verse 17. Catch this. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased of goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Hallelujah. See, these people had deceived themselves. And how much of the modern-day church world are we looking at that people said, yeah, I've got everything I need. I don't, you know, I don't need God. Even preachers, you know, I don't need God to give me my message. I've got all these books on, on messages I can read, and I can just copy one off. People aren't praying anymore. People aren't seeking God. People don't humble themselves 
in the in the eyes of God and 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 submit themselves. And that's what God wants us to do, submit ourselves unto God. Hallelujah. And and just allow him to take care of us. Blessed are the poor in spirit, and those that realize how much we need him. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. All right, verse 4. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. I'd like to bring out this word mourn here. This is not talking about you know, mourn and oh me and oh my and you know, just so depressed and or even somebody like somebody at a funeral, somebody squalling and, and and miserable and crying all the time and miserable. No, it's not talking about that. But uh, mourn here is in the uh, as in a uh, having sorrow because you sense a spiritual need. You realize, God, I need you. I need you. I need you. I need you. I need you to help me. <clears throat> and that's what God wants us to do. And also, and that will make us all the more, more thankful when he blesses us and when he helps us. I mean, you know, I like to laugh and joke and, and goof around and most anybody knows me kind of, you know, I'm goofy as the next guy and probably more than some. And God don't want us to be just you know, oh, you know, solemn and, you know, so whole, you know, outward holy. We are no physically, uh, 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 spiritually any good, you know, I mean, or physically any good. Uh, he wants us, but he wants us to realize how much we need one another and also how much that um, uh, we, when we look at uh, the unsaved, when we look at people who, who, who need God, and we can realize, praise God, God can help them. I mean, it's, it's, it's a sense of compassion. It's a sense of, I mean, we see somebody out there that uh, broken and, and, and wounded and, and, and miserable or someone who's a raging monster and, and, and or a child abuser or, or a, a, a somebody that just, the devil himself, you know, I mean, just people that are just, terrible but when we look at them and we can see why well, they need god i mean i mean uh stan used to uh, send me letters all the time what can we do about this and how do we stop people from doing that you know the only the only way we can ever stop people from sinning is to get them introduced to Jesus. And that's what I'm all about here. I'm just trying to help you see Jesus and help you strive to get him. If you get Jesus in your life, we don't have to make regulations and or pass laws or, or anything else that will, will stop people, I mean, from doing bad things. Government has tried to get into that stuff. Uh, I remember a little something in the 20s, a little something called prohibition. And they said, oh, there was a great religious fervor back then. And and they said, okay, I know what we'll do. We'll pass a law and make liquor um, uh, illegal. And they closed all the bars, and they had a big thing, you know, Elliot Ness, and, and then them guys go around smashing beer barrels and stuff and, 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 and uh, making alcohol illegal. What did it do? Did it make alcohol any less? Nah. That's where the term bathtub gin came from. I mean, they would make it in homes in their bathtubs, <laughs> which kind of... <laughs> I mean, it must have been a stinky bunch because they, you know, they couldn't take a bath. They were, they, you know, their their tubs were all full of alcohol. But uh, uh, you know, and it just all it did was, you know, make it illegal. People are going to do it. You can't pass that stuff and and make it mandatory. You got, you can't change a man's outward appearance. You can't change a man's outward perception. You have to change him on the inside. And Guys, we can't do that ourselves, but I know a God who can. God can change your heart and, and give you a heart full of love, give you a heart full of mercy, give you a heart full of uh, uh, that your, our joy is in him. Blessed are they that mourn. Praise God. Hallelujah. Here's a, a fine example of, of what this was talking about. It's in Luke, the fifth chapter. Luke 5 and uh, verse 4. 
And uh, this, oh, I guess we'll start in verse 3. And uh, he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let down your nets for a draught. Simon answered, said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. When he had done this, he enclosed a great multitude of fish. The net break. We're going to skip down to verse 8 here. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And... It's just basically showing what a mourning, having a sorrow in your heart, realizing. I mean, he had he had just, uh, we picked this up if we'd read the rest of the story here. They'd been fishing all night. And they just came in in the morning and uh, were cleaning their nets. And everywhere Jesus went, he had this huge crowd because, you know, he healed and, and cured and taught and, and gave them whatever they need. I mean, there was no food. He, somebody had a couple of biscuits. He could break it and feed thousands. You know, he could just do anything. And so people were constantly crowding him and trying to get touch, touch him and get close to him. And uh, that's why he got in this boat and, and went a little way out from shore and he could teach the people. And so Peter had been hearing his teaching and hearing his wonderful words. And and then Jesus did a personal miracle for Peter here. or That's a, one of Simon's other names. And uh, uh, there was nothing. They had been out there all night fishing. He let down that net just for a minute, start pulling it back up. There were so many, it was breaking. And we was at Monster Hall. Peter saw the presence of God. He saw, he knew the power. He had heard him talk. He had saw his miracles. He, he knew how this was God Almighty. And that's why he fell down at his knees and said, depart from me. I'm not worthy. I'm a sinful man. I, 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 I'm not worthy of your attention. Oh, and, and, and that's what God wants us to be. And Jesus didn't make him leave. Peter became one of Jesus' apostles and did mighty works from God. Hallelujah. And it, but it's just, it's just that attitude. It's that attitude that we must have if we're going to live for him. Be humble. Just realize no matter how much God. I mean, I've known preachers that God has used them to raise the dead. I mean, nowadays, modern days, and we're not talking about ancient history. God is used to heal. God is used to uh, change people's lives. I mean, that's one thing the Bible uh, that uh, uh, separates the Bible from uh, modern literature and uh, uh, modern books. I mean, there are great, marvelous works of literature out there now. But what do they do? They might change your attitude a little bit. But the Bible will change your life. They might change your perspective a little bit. But the Bible will change your mind. Hallelujah. It will help you be a better man than you're able to be by yourself. Praise God. Praise God, praise God. Another uh, scripture over here, uh, over in uh, 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter and the 11th verse, it, it says that, Therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Praise God. It's just, you know, people say, Well, God ain't going to put nobody in hell. God is a God of love. God is a God of peace. God is a God of mercy. Yes, he is. But he is also righteous, and he is just. And the Bible said explicitly, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. In, e in Ezekiel, the 18th chapter. Uh, Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. And that's not talking about, you know, laying you in Rosedale Cemetery or whatever cemetery you have. I mean, that's talking about not talking about this life that's talking about eternal 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 you need god therefore knowing the terror of the lord we persuade that's why people go out and try to talk to people about being a christian about being what god is and how much god will love you and how god will give you the power to overcome yourself first corinthians 15 and 57 says but thanks be to god which giveth us the victory 
through our Lord Jesus Christ. What's that victory over? That's why it was left blank. It's not victory over this or victory over that. It's just victory. You can fill in the space yourself. It's just victory. You have victory over anything you need the victory over through Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Hallelujah. All right. Uh, next verse. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Got a, a neat little thing I've carried in a little notebook of mine for years. A little definition of meekness. Patient. To endure with submission what might have been evaded. Catch that? To endure with submission. Just let it go. Let it, let it happen. What might have been evaded. I mean, you could have got out of it. You could have, man, I don't want nothing to do with this. And, but you endured it. As opposed to bearing what cannot be avoided. Praise God. Vine's uh, dictionary tells us, not of outward behavior, but of inward grace of the soul toward God. Having a temper of spirit, accepting God's dealing with us as good, without disputing or resisting. That's the definition of meekness. Blessed are the meek, for they shall, hallelujah, inherit the earth. Fine example of a meek man. The Bible said in uh, Numbers, back in the Old Testament, uh, now Moses was the meekest man ab above all men on the face of the earth. Moses was meek. And does that mean he was a wimp? That mean, that mean he was just pushover? No. Moses, it was talking about when Moses led the children of Israel out of bondage. He stood flat up to the most powerful man in the world at that time, Pharaoh, and said, let, God said, let my people go. I mean, <laughs> frankly, guys, Moses had to be meek above all men. I mean, look what God did with him and used him. He called on 10 plagues in Egypt. Water turned into blood. Uh, all kinds of insects and reptiles and stuff just covered the face of, uh, made the, the sun go dark for three days solid in Egypt, in the desert. I mean, and just in that one, not in the whole world, because the Bible said over in the land of Goshen where the children of Israel were, it wasn't dark there, but it's only right where Pharaoh's kingdom was. I mean, look at the power of God in that man. God would use him. Uh, he said, stretch out your rod or stretch out your, your staff that you, you carry. And when they were Israel was trapped between the Red Sea and the Egyptian army on their way out, God parted the ocean. And the children of Israel walked through that path on dry land. They didn't slog through the mud. They didn't, people say, well, the Red Sea was only uh, uh, 15 inches deep right then. 30. Huh? 36. Oh, really? Praise God. Obi just uh, uh, piped in over there. He did some study on it. He said it was 36 feet there. And it was 36 feet deep. He made a path through that. Because the Bible said, you can read about this in um, Numbers or in, uh, uh, I think it's the 14th chapter of the book of Exodus, uh, where he parted the Red Sea. And uh, the Bible said the wall, there was walls of water on both sides. Wall. So if you get a picture of it, the way I look at it, it was the world's first and biggest aquarium. Okay? <laughs> You know, I can I can see you know Johnny, little old, or little old, or little, little Rudy, wild little kid that every one of us knows. You know Johnny or Billy or or Jimmy or whoever his name is, Alexander. I don't care, but he's over there poking his finger because you can see all them fishes still on the other side of that water while they're parading through on dry land. And then uh, when the children of Israel got through. And Pharaoh and his army said, well, if you can do it, we can do it too. Started out across the middle over there, and 
They got about halfway through, God knocked all the chariot wheels. There were 600 chariots and an army facing, chasing Israel. Knocked their wheels off, made them bog down in the middle, and then brought them two walls of water crashing down and destroyed Pharaoh's army and with Pharaoh. God did that because Mo he used Moses. Moses had to be a meek man. So see, being a meek man doesn't mean not standing up for what's right. You can stand up for what's right. It's just your perception. And you realize where my power is. My power is not me. This old flesh, this is just a the old hunk of clay, this old body that we live in, it's what, 70% water? You know, and the Bible says we're made out of dust. Is How much more is it? 85, wow, okay. It's a bunch of us is water. And uh, the Bible said that uh, out of the dust of the earth, God made man. So, uh, and what's dust? Dust is not nothing. Dust is the residue of dirt, okay? You know, you can grow one thing out of dust. You know what the one thing is you can grow out of dust? Dust bunnies. Them little things that you find out under your bed. You know, it's, just, it's, it's got no nutrition in it at all. It's nothing. It's worthless. So you mix that all that huge percentage of water with that dust. And this old flesh, when you get to thinking about yourself, you think you're somebody. <laughs> all you are is mud. <laughs> not even very nutritious but you just mud that's all you are but god has given us the right and the privilege hallelujah i think it's in second corinthians uh the fourth or fifth chapter he says he has given us a treasure in earthen vessels he has allowed us to possess a, a, a treasure inside of us that is his own spirit that he will use and 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 help us to be everything we want to do. But he wants us to be meek. He wants us to not think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. Praise God. Hallelujah. Give the glory to God. That was the one thing that got Moses in trouble. The one time that um, the children of Israel it was just... Is that we, you know, we're always griping and complaining and snipping and snarling. One time, uh, they were griping at Moses about something, and and um, God told him, Moses, uh, I want you to go over there and speak to that rock. Before Moses had hit the rock with his uh, staff, and uh, uh, water gushed out. Now you got to think about there's like three million people here. So this isn't some little old trickle. He put a crack in a rock and you get a little trickle of water. This is enough water to satisfy two to three million people. So there had to be a small river come out of this thing. When God does something, he does it right. But this one time, uh, he said, God said, speak to the rock. And then people had made him so mad and so ornery. He was so fed up. And he walked over to that rock and just hit it with his staff and said, "What well, must we fetch water for you people? Because he did. God didn't let him go over in the promised land. You know, it got said, because you didn't give me glory. So we, we have to be careful and remember that God, that no matter how much God wants to use us, and he will use us if we submit ourselves, he'll use you, but he wants you to have the right attitude. The meekness will protect you from getting yourself in trouble with God. And the thing is, uh, meekness will let people see Jesus in you. Let them understand that the power is not you. The power is not me. The power is God. All right. All right. Um, blessed in verse 6. Remember, we're still in the fifth chapter of Matthew. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. For they shall be filled. Hallelujah. Guys, no matter what I say about God, no matter how I try to propagate him and, 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 and push him towards you, I can't force God down your throat. God don't even force himself on you. He said, he that hungers and thirsts after righteousness, you've got to want him. You've got to want him. And that's all I'm here for. I'm just showing him, showing you a way to get to him. 
and showing you that he does love you and he will protect you. I mean, uh, this 27th episode of the, um, you all know I've, I've talked to subjects and I try to always point towards Jesus because Jesus will fight your battles for you. Jesus will protect you. Jesus will take care of you. He will uh, 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 solve your problems for you. But you've got to belong to him. Blessed are they a hunger and thirst after righteousness. If your hunger means and thirst is, is, a, is a need, you got to realize your need. And not only realize it, you go to fulfill it. If you're walking in the desert, you know, you're out there trudging. We've all seen them things in the movies, them old boys just trudging along in the desert. Sometimes they're crawling and, and they, they see that... Uh, looks like a pool of water off in the sand and they go scrambling and tumbling and do everything to get to that pool of water and they uh, do everything and hopefully it's not a mirage or a, a sight but when they do it they do everything they can to get there and they don't just very dignified take their little dainty cup out and give themselves a sip. No, they put their face in the water. They try to, because they're, they're, they're dying, they realize how much they, they're thirsty. A man that, uh, hallelujah, it's kind of funny. When I, 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 I grew up, you know, when I was a kid, I was kind of a picky eater. I'm, I, my mom would testify to any one of you. Man, I didn't like green beans. I didn't like spinach i didn't like this i didn't like that i did i was i would need a lot of stuff you know but something funny about knowing hunger when i got older and i kind of ran away from home when i was a uh for a little bit when i was uh you know late teens and when i was living out by myself uh you you go hungry a few times and something about going hungry you realize boy them green beans aren't nearly as nasty as i thought they were Man, them turnip greens, uh, uh, man, there's real something. Think about them things. I mean, different kinds of meats and different kinds of, you know, I mean, stuff is when you're hungry, things taste good. Uh, there's a, a verse in the book of Proverbs in the 27th chapter. Uh, it says, the full soul loatheth the honeycomb, but to the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. That's uh, Proverbs 27 and 7. Uh, look what this is saying. Uh, the full soul, the soul that's satisfied with itself. The honeycomb was, was in the Bible terminology, was known as the most delightful. The honey was, a lot of people, even scientists, honey uh, is almost the perfect food. It's got nutrition. It's got sweetness. It tastes good, and it's good for you. Uh, I mean, nothing is better than a natural sweetener than honey. But if your soul full of you don't want it you don't want anything else the most perfect food in the world that it loatheth it it loathes it it can't stand it. it's disgusting you don't want anything to do with that but to the hungry soul you can man um, they say hungry people eat anything and a lot of times they do because they need there's a craving there there's a wanting there's a desire there Hallelujah. So if you're hungering and thirsting after what? In verse uh, uh, 6, after righteousness. Praise God. That's what God wants you to be. Hallelujah. And sometimes God's got to take every one of us down to the bottom before he can raise us up. I mean, when we're satisfied with our ways and our wills and our wants and our desires and we're satisfied the way, we won't search for God. I mean, I, I believe that's one reason why uh, the Bible said Jesus told the disciples one time it's easier for a, a rich man to go through the eye of a needle. I mean, it's easier for a, a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man entering the kingdom of heaven. They say, well, I thought you said uh, money is, is not the root of all evil. No, it's not. But it's their attitude. If they got everything they need... Why do they need God? But God, it's not your riches. It's not your wealth. It's not your fame. It's not the stuff that you can 
make do on your own. Hallelujah. God, there is no life that's fulfilled without God. How many of the richest, most powerful people, the most popular people in the world are just miserable? Robin Williams is a fine example. He had everything. He was the king of comedy. People loved him, and he did great works and did it. But there was an emptiness in his heart, and he wound up hanging himself. Elvis Presley, they call him the king of rock and roll. He was popular. He was loved. He was adored. But he, they tell us he was the most miserable, sorrowful, just tormented man. Howard Hughes, a multi-billionaire, but he drove himself so crazy with his own, you know, paranoia, and, 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 and he just was never satisfied. And so he's got so much, and he's constantly afraid of people stealing his stuff. They found him wandering in the desert, an old uh, shiftless hobo. See, money and power and fame does not satisfy you. The only thing that satisfies you is Jesus. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Hallelujah. Happy. Happy are they. Because if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, God will fill that. God will take care of you. Okay, verse 7. Blessed are the merciful. For they shall obtain mercy. I thought this kind of neat here. Mercy. How little of that we see. We got a, fi a prime example over here in the 8th chapter of the book of John. On one time Jesus was, was uh, there in the temple and, and there was a bunch of people uh, drugged this woman in the temple and throwed her down at Jesus' feet. I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's uh, in the 8th chapter of uh, St. John and in a starting in the first verse and um, goes through the 10th verse. So it's St. John 8, uh, 1 through 10. And I'll just basically tell you the story. And they threw this woman down at Jesus' feet, not wanting any justice. They're just trying to mess with Jesus. There was no mercy there. Uh, they told him, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now the law said, and the law, the law of Moses had said that she should be stoned. But they said to Jesus, what do you say? Jesus didn't even bother talking to him. He just stooped, started writing on the ground. And they kept asking him, asking him and bugging him. He said to them, he that is without sin, let him throw the first stone. They, being condemned of their own conscience, went away, every one of them, from the oldest to the youngest. When Jesus looked up and he saw her, he said, Woman, where are your accusers? He said, I don't have any. He said, Neither do I. Go and sin no more. Hallelujah. That's what the mercy of the world's all about. They are, they're just manipulation. They don't really care about people. And it's kind of ironic, too. Something I always wondered about. If this woman was taken in adultery, it's kind of hard for somebody to be in adultery by themselves, isn't it? All they did was bring the woman in there. Well, no, we won't get into that category there. But um, uh, he's over here. <laughs> Mine's erasing. I can see that twinkle in his eye. But um, no, I mean, and the Bible said, um, I believe it's a Leviticus 10.10. 10, or no, Leviticus 20 and 10. And I, I personally think that's what Jesus was writing on the ground. Uh, it says that uh, the, man, the man and woman that have been taken in adultery shall be stoned. And I'm sure that Jesus was writing on the ground, where is the man? But we don't know that, and that's just Ted one and one. They're speculating. But that's what the mercy of the world is all about. They don't care. Praise God. But God is merciful. God wants you to show mercy. If you show mercy, you shall reap mercy. The Bible said in Galatians, whatsoever you sow, you shall reap. Hallelujah. God wants us to be merciful. Here's another fine example about what mercy is all about. 
over here in the 18th chapter of the book of Matthew. Matthew, the 18th chapter. Um, and uh, Jesus gave us an example of, of what mercy is all about. 18, uh, starting in uh, verse 23. 18 and 23. Therefore the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. I'm not going to read the whole thing because my show is kind of running out of time here. But you can read for it. Read it. Matthew 18 verse uh, 23 through 35. Let me give you a little gist of it. There was this man who was uh, when the, uh, his boss had taken uh, into account and it found out that he owed 10,000 talents. I mean, a uh, little more in our perspective, uh, 10,000 was the highest known number at that day. In the Greek uh, figuring, there was no number, so it was an astronomical number. And talents was a, 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 a weight of something of, you know, around 120 pounds. So it was just unbelievable. Uh, one Bible scholar um, figured up one thing. If it was 10,000 talents of gold, it was probably about... Uh, ten million dollars. Okay, I mean it was just unbelievable, unattainable amount the man owed. The man fell down at the king's feet and begged, and because the king had had told him, okay, you owe that man, uh, you're going to prison, you're going to debtor's prison, um, and uh, 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 you know the man fell and begged mercy from the king. The king had mercy on him. And frankly forgave him the debt. Unattainable amount. And forgave him. The man promptly went out. And found one of his co-workers. That owed him 100 pence. Uh, in Bible terminology. A pence. They usually work for about a penny a day. So 100 pence is a couple months wages. You know not a big. Something if you give him a little time. He could work it off. A man fell at this other guy's feet who had just been forgiven and said, asked, said the same exact thing this man had said to the king. Did this man have mercy? No. He took that guy by the throat and throwed him in debtor's prison. Had no mercy on him at all. When the king heard about what this guy did, he's, he was so mad, he promptly, he said, Oh, wicked and slothful servant, I forgave you all that debt because you desired me. Should you not have con had compassion on thy fellow servant? And he was wrought and delivered him to the tormentors. And that's the same way that God's mercy is to us. When he forgives us our sins, and he, we go down in that water in Jesus' name and get our sins washed away, and we rise to walk in the newness of life, and he receive his spirit, which is the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. And we speak in tongues and we have the power of the Almighty God living in and giving us the victory, all the victory we need. What is that worth? Can you go to Mayo Clinic? Can you go to the President of the United States and say, I'm, I'm, I'm weighed down by this weight and debt of sin that I have. They can't fix that. But it's God. When we had no way to pay, when we had no way to be righteous before God, God shed his blood for us and bought our salvation and redeemed us from the price and the curse of sin. Hallelujah. And showed us mercy. And he wants us to have the same mercy. The, that's the death, that, the type and shadow of what that man owed that king. That's what we owe God. How could we not possibly show mercy and love and forgiveness and understanding to anybody else that we see after what God did for us? Blessed, blessed, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. It's linked, guys. It's linked. If you want mercy from God, you better show mercy. Amen. 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 That's like forgiveness. When Jesus told us the Lord's Prayer, we covered a few weeks ago, he said, um, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. It's, it's hand in hand, man. 
It's hand in hand. God will have mercy on you. He wants you to have mercy. You want to be a Christian? You want to be what Jesus wants you to be? Live the way he wants you to live. It's easy if you put your hands in him and allow him to lead you. Verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Pure, 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 pure. Hebrews 12, 14 says, Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Uh, 1 Peter 1, 16, God told us through uh, the Apostle Peter, it was God speaking, he said, Be holy, for I am holy. God wants us to live. Holiness is, a, is, is an attitude. It's, it's a, a lifestyle. It's uh, keeping our bodies clean and pure. And, and, and that's why a lot of us apostolics you know, preach against the, 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 the sins of the flesh and, and carnal things and things with, that pol pollute your body and things that would destroy. Because the Bible says our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And, and I know standards of holiness vary from church to church to church to church. And that's what having the Holy Ghost is all about, is listening to God. And God will help you. Um, uh, that's why uh, Paul told us, Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in the thing which he alloweth. I think that's Romans 14.22. Romans 14.22 tells us that. Praise God, because we live by faith. We live by the faith of the Son of God. Hallelujah, who gave himself for us, who loved us so much. And he just told us to keep ourselves pure. Keep peace in your heart. Hallelujah. Keep a, a humble, forgiving, loving. That's some of the things that will help you keep peace and stay pure between you and God. Praise God. I'm about running out of time, guys. Uh, verse 9. I'm kind of racing through these now. Verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. You want to be noted as one of God's kids? Because God is peace. God is love. God is joy. God is... You want to be like Dad? If God is your Father, hallelujah... Praise God. You will have the same attitude. You will have the same outlooks. You will have the same spirit and uh, presentation that he does. Praise God. We'll go over here in 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, and the 17th verse. Wherefore, come out from among them. 2 Corinthians 6, 17. And be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. Check this out. Verse 18. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Blessed are the peacemakers. They shall be called the children of God. Hallelujah. That's what it, you know, if God is your father, praise God, we're going to go to our daddy's home when we leave this old world. And it's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it. Over here in James, the fourth chapter and the 17th verse. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Praise God. Be a peacemaker. Be a peacemaker. Man, if, I mean, Lord knows we're surrounded by so many people who want to fight and scrap and make trouble. You want to be known as a child of God? Be a peacemaker. Be someone who, you know, it takes two to fight. <laughs> I mean, you say, people say, oh, little Johnny told his dad when he got after him after school for fighting at school. He said, John, he said, Daddy, I didn't do it. He made me. Well, ain't nobody going to be in trouble for fighting. You can't fight with just one. Praise God. If you, and a lot of times it takes more courage, it takes more uprightness not to fight than it does to fight. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Verse 10, 
And number the eighth beatitude, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets that which were before you. Hallelujah. Over here in Second Timothy, the second chapter, and in the twelfth verse, Paul tells us, For if you suffer with him, you shall also reign with him. Huh? Ten minutes. Oh, ten minutes. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> and uh yeah. All right. Um Praise God. So it's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it to live for God. To be what God wants you to be. Hallelujah. Um, Your reward. Remember, your reward is not here on this earth. I mean, what's it? Just a few days. The the Bible likened us to to just uh, leaves in the wind and, and a flower that blooms just for a second, but then it fades into nothing. I mean, it's... It, this life is is so so fragile and so it's like the blowing of the wind. It, it's so quick, and we're not talking about here in this life. We're talking about eternity. We're talking about living for God and being what God wants you to be and being how God wants you to be. Hallelujah, guys. Be like Jesus. I know they had a big commercial thing about be like Mike. You know. And and be like the the Jordans and all that, and wear his shoes, and you know, be able to leap over tall buildings with a single bound, you know, and all that. No, yeah, be like Jesus. Be like Jesus. Michael Jordan is a, you know, is is beset with his many problems, and look at all the trouble he's been over the years. He was a king of basketball and had to quit because he got in trouble with gambling, try to distract people from playing baseball for a while, and then he went back, and yeah, he's got all them rings, but. There's no peace in that. There's no peace in that. Your peace, your joy. The Bible said in uh, uh, that the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. I think it's in Romans, the 14th chapter. But righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Live for God. Serve God. Obey Him. He loves you. And He'll help you. You say to yourself, I don't... Um, uh, uh, I can't do this. Of course you can't do this. That's what I told God when I first came to him. But I made him one promise. I made him one promise. If you help me, I'll try. I just never quit trying. Trying to do the best I can. He never he never let me come short. He always helps me. There's an old gospel song that says he reached farther down than I can reach up. Praise God. You can make it, guys. You can make it. Hallelujah. I got a poem here God gave me a few years back. And basically, uh, it's just for the people who, you know, I'm too busy to live for God. I'm too, I'm too doing my own thing. I don't want nobody to tell me what to do. Well, here's a little poem God gave me. It's called, Fun's Over When Jesus Comes. They live so wild and free, never will answer to any man. Oblivious to the price due in eternity, running to and fro across this evil land, like the raging wave on a rolling sea, not willing to be harnessed for any good, saying, I will be what I want to be. I'll never submit in the way that I should. O foolish and unlearned child of the night, don't you know this life is short and undone? You better surrender to God your whole life because all your fun is over when Jesus comes. Praise God. Live for God. Love Him. He'll help you. And He'll take you all the way home with Him. Praise God. We're going to close with our final scripture here, our favorite scripture. Psalms, the 19th chapter and the 14th verse. Then let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Live for him. Love him. He'll help you. He loves you. 
and he will help you go all the way with him. Pray for me. Like I say, our um, Facebook address is uh, um, bit.ly dot uh, bit dot ly forward slash rev ted tar. My email address, send me a, 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 a note, uh, is rev dot ted tar at gmail dot com. Uh, like I say, we're sorry we're not on live on Twitch here for the month of March, but we're working that out. We're working toward being live on YouTube on uh, live youtube.com forward slash geeky antics. We want to thank uh, OB and Yogi one more time for allowing us to be here, and we'd ask you guys to pray for us, and uh, we'll try to grow in him. And until we meet again, I hope to see you soon. In Jesus' name, bye now.